what I'm proposing cannot happen inside the Western world. Anywhere in the Western world, anywhere in the developed world, if I stand up and say, I've got a strange idea or an innovative idea, thousands of people will literally stand up and stop me. Right, so I'm now going to go to somewhere outside the Western world and I'm going to develop an innovation hub. Let's take the state of Hawaii. It's an island chain in the middle of the Pacific. It's isolated and it's a microcosm of the rest of the world. If Hawaii, as a full state, was to phase out fossil fuels, what would its options be? Hey guys, Got welcome it. to Capital Cosm. Today we've got Simon Michaud back on the show. Didn't mean for that to rhyme, but nonetheless, hey Simon, thank you for coming back on. G'day mate, nice to see you again. Likewise. Well, hey, well, let's just dive right in. I know you're working on a few things at the moment. One of these things is your so-called purple transition, not green transition, that's bound to fail, yeah. uh, according to your work. But walk us through what this purple transition is. Okay, so um, this came about from, um, the original work was to actually map out the green transition. If we were to do it, what would it look like? And certain problems became very apparent very quickly. And so what happens? Right, and so when I was presenting that to people, uh, 238 times I've now presented and uh, uh, to someone somewhere, somehow. And about a third of the time it's been to government, like a government organisation. Their reaction was very interesting. And so what that, that reaction told me was anything conventional is, you know, uh, we're, we're running out of, the tape is running out. We're running out of ideas in conventional space. So I started to look in the unconventional space. Now, I've actually found three foundation technologies that will underpin everything, and they facilitate everything else. All three are at commercial pilot scale, and as it turns out, all three are being developed in Copenhagen. I actually went to see, I actually went to Copenhagen. Uh, yeah, I'll show you in a sec. So if I can share my screen. So, uh, yep, that's that one there, share. So you should be able to see. Yep. So that's the actual title. So if I share this in presentation mode, is that coming up on your screen? Yep. I in see presentation it mode? Crystal clear. All right. Okay. So this was the title of what I'm presenting at the moment. So black swans, white swans, and the purple transition. To save time, let's go th uh, go through parts you might have seen already and go straight to the purple transition. So let's. So you're seeing um, report of mineral reserves and estimated resources and undersea resources, right? Yep. I see okay, this nickel, lithium. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So this is actually the green transition and the metals we would need if we were to go by that plan. And so that's the same data in linear scape. It's, it's not going to happen. So at the heart of the purple transition is a change of what we call the commodity sector. So when we talk about, when you watch the six o'clock news and they talk about how things are going, you hear about finance and economics and the stock market, sometimes about technology. I say, okay, all good and well, but all of those systems really look like this. There's four aspects. There's energy, minerals, economics, and technology. And no matter what you do, you can't separate those four. Right, and you can't really consider one without considering the other three. And it's understood that every single one of them ultimately is harvesting natural resources from the natural environment at a planetary scale. Right, so this is how we really are. And so any new system will have to have a similar structure, but it will, we will have to recognize this. Whereas to, at the moment, everything's about money and natural resources is considered to be infinite and, and just magic happens and it appears. The relationship between all four aspects and us and the, and the planetary environment is changing and that's forcing an evolution. Right, so at the very center, we've got uh, a new commodity industry. So you've got two sides of the equation. You've got the application technology and you've got the generation of electricity. At the application side, we want transport, which at the moment is IC petroleum, electricity and manufacture. On the other side, the raw materials to get to that is oil, gas and coal for now. Now we've got nuclear. So we want to knock out IC petroleum. And now we've got all this new technology that we call renewables, you know, wind and solar and have you. Wind and solar are flagged to be the dominant 
uh, power systems for the next industrial era. That's that's what current thinking believes. And we want electric vehicles, biofuels, and hydrogen fuel cells. Electric vehicles have a problem with the batteries, as in the materials to actually produce those batteries is going to be a problem. Um, and then there's there's a number of other practical issues as well. But the first one we hit is is the supply of raw materials. Biofuels is a limited supply of biomass. You can't the, the planet can't supply enough biomass. Hydrogen. Now, I'm going to propose counter to hydrogen, but it's current limitations in storage and transport of such a large amount of hydrogen. And hydrogen's an energy carrier, not an energy source. You've got to produce it. So how much hydrogen? Um, solar and wind fall down where they need a power buffer because they're highly intermittent. Now, current thinking is we only need six, you know, five to seven hours. Uh but that's just that that manages your your day to day, day and night intermittency, you know, sh shortfalls between supply and demand. It does not manage the difference between, say, summer and winter. So, I make a case that current thinking hasn't really done that. Until we resolve a way of storing that power, solar and wind aren't going to work. So, hydro, geothermal, bio waste, and wave all have their place and all work, but you can't really expand them because they are they're all based on geographic specific sites. You, you can't just whack a hydro plant anywhere and hope for the best. So each one of them have their limitations. They all have their place, um, but they're not, uh, we can't expand them greatly. Now, conventional nuclear, uh, what I sort of say here is I, I did a study where if you were to expand the current nuclear fleet, it, uh, it actually can't expand fast enough to be useful. Even if we took five years to build a nuclear plant, plant of average size, we still can't get there fast enough to actually be the primary energy source. This is the sheer size of it. So all, all the other issues about safety and, and, and everything like that, that that's that's, that's uh, um, other issues again, but I'm going to have a counter proposal. So we've also got this thing called the um, economy of heat. When we actually sort of manufacture stuff, we, it, it's actually heat that, that um, is the driving force for a lot of it. Like most of coal and gas is actually consumed in heat in manufacture of stuff. And the generation of electricity is also around heat. And if we knock out coal, much of our manufacture just will, doesn't really have a, a counterpart. So we actually need something to replace that with. <clears throat> so the first of the three foundation technologies Internal combustion engines fuel with ammonia. I'll talk about that in a moment. But the pertinent questions here is the exhaust gas, has that been managed correctly? Because, you know, the nitrous oxide is going to be a, a problem gas. Then you've got the problem of unburnt ammonia coming out the exhaust gas. And ammonia is a toxic substance to living things, right? And so there are problems. But the, but the practical question is, can we produce ammonia directly out of seawater? instead of fresh water. And if we have heat, then yes, yes, we can. The second technology is liquid fuel fission using thorium as the fuel, also known as thorium molten salt. And that can actually produce heat at 560 degrees uh, Celsius. The third technology, <clears throat> I want my computers, there it is, it's not that hard. The third technology is the burning of iron powder as a replacement for coal. And we can do that with uh, replacement temperatures of up to 2000 degrees Celsius. So what are we doing? Fossil fuels being phased out. The green transition faces serious resource supply bottlenecks. Even if it was to work, it may not be uh, able to maintain, uh, we still not be able to maintain the same capacity and flexibility of fossil fuels. And so if that won't work, what might? And I've been calling it the purple transition. <clears throat> so first, what are we trying to do here? We want electricity generation, we want transport, and we want manufacture. <coughs> Excuse me. We want reliability and consistently stable in all weathers and all geographical locations, preferably in a concentrated form, preferably with a low materials footprint, a long working life, and when they do come offline, they're designed to be recycled, whatever it is. We want minimal waste plume with a very low environmental impact right across the value chain. Right, that's what we want. 
So here's what I think, what I'm proposing. A purple transition, a bit of thorium, burning of iron powder, ammonia ICE, and they all link together. But at the centre of it is a new understanding of what the commodities industry actually is. Where do we get our resources? How do we use them? How do we manage our energy? All of that, that has to change and it has to be the very heart of things. Right, so let's unpack this. So this is uh, thorium molten salt. This is a report from the um, Oakland Ridge Nuclear Laboratory, 1972. It's a, it's a status update of research and development that was done you know, over those years. Uh, uh, previous years. Basically, it was an outcome by saying, this works. So what this is, the thorium fuel is in the form of a salt, and that fuel is not radioactive. So it doesn't have hazard. It, the hazard sheet is don't get moisture in it, so it doesn't dissolve. You bombard it with neutrons from a neutron source, either a plug of uranium or a proton lamp will also do the job. Some of the thorium... Uh, goes through a series of isotope changes and becomes an isotope of uranium, uranium-233. That uranium-233 heats up because it's radioactive and it melts the salt. The salt turns to liquid. The liquid, which is now very hot, circulates around between the reactor and the uh, heat exchanger tank. And so what happens here is, is it goes round and round and round and round you can actually take fuel out and add fuel in without stopping the reactor. There are two safety mechanisms that stop the heat going too far. Uh, the, the, if the reaction gets too much, you have what's called Doppler broadening and the reaction collapses. Also, if the heat goes too far, you've got a freeze plug and the fuel just drains out of the reactor into containment tanks and you know, manage it that way. So there are two safety things. So this is almost... The, the, the problems with this stuff is, is so different, it's almost not nuclear. So it needs to be managed differently. Right, 1969, uh, Oak Ridge had a uh, 7 megawatt system running. It ran for 6,000 hours power generation using thorium molten salt without an, 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 an issue of stoppage. The Chinese now have a commercially operating 2 megawatt system in the Gobi Desert. Uh, you don't need water to cool these down. That's another sort of uh, bonus. So, and they're selling it commercially. So the Chinese are already doing it. We're trying to do it. Here is the actual uranium that the two systems compared. So uranium light water, we're going to take 123 million tonnes of uranium ore, and we're going to make 32 tonnes of nuclear fuel rod assemblies. Put it into a power, uh, nuclear power plant, and over, say, one year, it generates 10,000 gigawatt hours of electrical power, assuming 92% availability. At the end of it, 96% is not usable, but still radioactive as. It's, it's the wrong isotope. It's uranium-238, whereas the reaction's controlled by uranium-235. So we've got about you know 31 tonnes of nuclear waste coming out from that cycle. Right, we're going to do the same thing with a thorium system. Now we're going to start out with 280 tonnes of monocyte sand. So already the system's much smaller. We're going to make some fuel, put the fuel in the reactor. This time, between one, it, it's about it's a, between one and four, four or five, something like that, percent of the fuel doesn't get burned up and is still radioactive. So, so most of what you put in is used up. What comes out, 53 kilograms of isotopes, and the isotopes are very different to the uranium sector. It's, it's, it tends to be things like xenon and cesium and strontium. It's, it's all, all the stuff that you find in a medical isotope lab. So running these reactors is similar to managing a medical isotope lab in a hospital. It, it's that level of, of security and sophistication. The waste that comes out, you store it for 300 years, not 10,000 or 100,000 depending on the isotope. Very different system. What's also interesting is you can mix in with the thorium salt, uranium, so it can be a uranium composite, but we can also, in some circumstances, burn through spent nuclear fuel. So these systems can run down the stockpile of spent nuclear fuel if we are organised. So, all right, very interesting. This is under development. Uh, Copenhagen Atomics in um, Copenhagen, they've actually got a, um, a system sort of up and running. They're actually in the process of producing these. 
So the, the full system that they're actually looking at is called the onion core. It sits inside a unit the size of a shipping container. So this thing would arrive on a truck. I actually went out to the factory and actually had a look at what they were producing. And uh, they're not, you know, once they've actually sort of got the equipment uh, and, and everything together, uh, I think their targets are actually quite reasonable because these are small. So you've got the core here. On one side, you've got the cooling system. You've got water, which basically water goes around to actually moderate the reactor <laughs> so they can control the temperature directly. Um, and this, you've got the heat exchanger through two levels of heat going through molten salt circuits. And so there's two levels here to make sure no radiation actually escapes the system. And that's what the full system is in size. It would literally arrive on a truck. Here is a picture of me wearing a tie for the first time in 25 years. Yeah. So, um, so Copenhagen Atomics, they're actually planning on um, each system will produce 100 megawatts of power of heat or 40 megawatts of electricity. So it's a modular system. They can put as many together as they want. Um, yeah, they're going to sell... Uh, they're not going to sell the reactors themselves. Uh, their business model is to sell the electricity, right? So, so you you have a contract for, what, for fifty years or whatever. Your reactor arrives and you pay for the electricity it develops, two cents a kilowatt. And so that's actually pretty good, as it turns out. So the reactors uh, we we whale well for the sale of electricity in twenty twenty eight. Um. And they're planning to make one of these a day out of this factory. Because they're not that large. We're not talking about like a, a Fukushima size reactor. And it's actually mobile. You put it on a truck and you take it away. Do we have enough so, time? Do we have enough time to scale it out globally? To uh, take that's into account an this, interesting question. So the problem here is not the production of the unit. But the production of uh, the, the the authorization to have the unit on site. If you say nuclear power to say the average person in the UK, they'll throw you out of the pub. Uh, so getting a government to authorize a license to put one of these on the site that's the the rate determining step. If we got us like these guys have been running for nine years now. They're not. There's there's several groups in thorium space. This is just one. I, I happen to go see them, and they're very kindly uh, sh showing me around their, their their factory, which is why I'm using their stuff they you know they've been running for nine years but they're they're they're, they're jumping through hoops for european um legislation if we got serious and said let's do it they could throw the switch tomorrow right <laughs> when you sort of say do we have the time well that depends on us you know if, if we actually got got to it i don't know the answer to that question is the simple answer. What what it probably will be is is all of this stuff is useful for some people, and other people will never see it because of the way we are. That's probably the most sensible answer I could come up with. It right. So that's one. The second. Uh, this is now burning of iron powder. So manufacturing is consuming about half of our energy, primary energy. Um, seventy three percent of coal, thirty seven percent of gas, seven percent of oil. 42% of electrically generated is going into manufacture. So if we knock out coal in particular, a lot of our manufacture just stops. So this is what the heat that we need for a lot of manufacturing systems at the moment. And so you're seeing things like, you know, well over a thousand degrees Celsius for a lot of it. And okay, you know, you know things like, um, but if we were to use non-fossil fuel systems to do it, there's only three that can compete. One is biofuels, some biofuels, not all. Right, but now we're back to, well, can the planet produce enough biomass to produce that much biofuel? So think about how much coal we use and imagine it being replaced by one of these systems. Uh, the next one's hydrogen gas, but you've got to make it. So how much hydrogen gas are we talking about here to replace coal? And then you've got electric um, resistance, like a arc furnace that's useful in some circumstances but not all the rest of them are not producing the power conventional nuclear is producing in, uh, power around the six or seven hundred degrees celsius and the thorium molten salt reactors are producing it at 560. 
uh, for safety reasons. So we need to get over a thousand. So what's been proposed is this. We're going to combust iron powder. So they make really fine powder, say a hundred micron, so, so maybe 50 micron. And so there's, there's technology doing that now for, for powder, uh, powder additive technologies. But instead of using it in paint, we're now going to burn it. The flame temperature is about 2000 degrees, depending on the oxygen levels involved. So one ton of iron powder create uh, contains about 1.6 to 1.9 megawatt hours of heat energy, depending on the final oxidization state. So it's got a volumetric density of around six to seven, where coal's around five. It's actually a little better than coal. Problem is it requires specialist equipment to use. You can't just get like a pack of matches and burn it, burn your iron. <laughs> so so it, it, it requires more sophisticated technology and we need to develop it. So iron powder is currently produced by powder manufacturers. What's interesting is we can refit just an existing coal-fired power station pretty easily. You know, we, we, don't, we don't need to do much to it. So combust the iron powder. So we can then put that into hydrogen production. So instead of using electrolysis, we could be producing hydrogen. And this makes the hydrogen economy possible because now we can actually make hydrogen locally. So when you pull up to a service station and you want to fill your car up full of hydrogen, instead of having it stored and delivered, it's actually made at the service station in a small scale unit. Uh, manufacture and um, smelting and refining. So what's interesting is we can recycle this stuff. Mm. So you burn your iron powder in a furnace, produces the heat, and we get iron oxide, also known as rust. Okay, so anything that's rusting is a possible energy source. Oh, really? Um, okay, so that's oxidization and that's reduction. But we can take the iron rust powder and we can turn it back into uh, pure iron powder. You can either do it in a hydrogen atmosphere or there's an electrochemical reduction. Uh, which requires electricity, and that will turn us back into high-purity iron powder. So you could have a facility that actually uses iron powder, and when it's actually sort of gone through, you recycle it. I don't. I haven't actually done the numbers of about how many times you could recycle it or if it's quality or whatever. But in principle, um, iron. We've got lots of iron lying around the place. But if we actually sort of were smart about how we 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 use this, we could generate a lot of heat. And from that heat comes everything else. So here's our we're methods of reduction and oxidization, producing the um, Fe powder from rust. So this, this is the reaction. None of these are producing carbon dioxide. Uh, and then we're going to burn the powder. So the proof of concept was in 2020. This is a group called Metalop. They're actually commercially um, uh, commercializing this. A pilot scale system uh, was run in 2022, 100 kilowatt system. And if you can see in the photograph that that's actually reasonably small, that could sit in any factory or in any system, right? So so we, we, we don't need, to, that's to generate electrical power. I want to use these things to support uh -huh. manufacture and use, uh, and use the thorium reactors to generate the electricity. What is the energy density of iron combustion versus thorium reactors? Like if, if thorium reactors were 100 on the scale, what would, where would uh, iron combustion fit into? I don't know. These, these are the sorts of things I would like to uh, do. Actually, it's possible I could do it in the Hawaii report. Wow. Uh, but it's, you know, there's the 10th and final scenario in the Hawaii report, which I can tell you about in a sec, is the purple transition. If we were to do the purple transition, what would that look like? Gotcha. Yeah, we'll go through the Hawaii report in a second. Yeah. So so all of these things are um, commercial. They're, they're being commercially done now, all, all three. Right, so back to batteries. At the moment, the world wants to make lithium battery technology, which will supply everything else. So this is a theoretical cathode, I think, based on the isotopes of, of different isotopes at an atomic level to make a cathode. So you've got the anode and the cathode. So the, the anode would be graphite, which we still need lots of. But but should we be using lithium chemistry? Now, now my work is showing that we don't have enough lithium. 
But stone the crows, lithium is in the bottom left-hand corner. And everything happens to be better than that. The, the, the best ones are the top right-hand corner. So the fluoride in your toothpaste, which is an industrial waste product, could be used to make a battery, as could sodium. In and in fact, if you... Are, are any of these in production at the moment? No, they're all through theoretical. Okay. So the, the sodium batteries are now starting to, to break through, but but the, but the world will not look at chemistry. I'm, I'm part of a battery re research group here in Finland, and they're considering the next generation of research. And for the lo love of money, they will not consider alternative battery chemistries, and they're insisting that the next generation of research will be lithium. And it, it's, it's, it, it's, it's like negotiating with a bush turkey where it puts its nest. Yeah, is it? <laughs> um, yeah, anyway, so these are theoretical. A friend and colleague of mine, um, is based in Estonia, is actually making these at a lab scale to prove that they work. Um, and he, he likes sodium. But if you take seawater, for example, and you desalinate it, which, which is what I'm going to do in one of my other projects, you've got to do something with the sea salt. Sea salt happens to be sodium chloride. So if you strip out sodium and chloride, you can make sodium ion batteries or chloride ion batteries. Just saying. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. So so why are we so, so hell bent? Why are we so hell bent on lithium ion batteries, not any of these other? Um, been giving this sort of thought. Uh, at one level, you know, people can see the money involved. Lots of money has been channeled into this, um, and so much money and support and. We're also a belief-based species, and so we'll we'll hang a hat on a solution and say this is what we want to do, mm. uh, and and we don't like change, especially if that change involves us doing a lot of change ourselves. Like you, you imagine that the work that you've been doing for the last ten years was now obsolete, and you had to actually start from scratch and do something else, where other people already have the advantage if you were to go that way. Um, uh, and, and then they would also say, well, we don't need to worry about lithium. You know, li lithium is available. We, we don't have to concern ourselves with things like you know, resources. There's no reason not to do lithium. But you know, things like lithium batteries catch fire. You know, there's, there's, to, to, to me, I'd rather see a sodium ion battery and actually see how that works. The performance of these things are different. So you, you, we, we might end up with a situation where you would match different battery chemistries to different applications, right? But we've also got to design these batteries to be recycled. The amount of batteries that we're talking about bringing online is huge and would far exceed any existing capability for waste handling. So um, anyway, so most of these things are found in industrial waste, like mine tailings. Um, so the valuable part becomes processing and refining into something useful, not the raw material itself. But my view of the world is to actually match and model the whole value chain. You can't just look at one bit and then go back to sleep. You've got to look at so from cradle to grave. Right, so make batteries out of something else, not rocket science. Uh, Ammonia-fueled ICE. So... This is actually uh, the, the the shipping company Marisk are actually trialing this in Copenhagen uh, right now. They've they've had a motor running continuously now for three or four months, right? So so they're they're really sort of looking at the things like the reliability of them. They, they plan to put them in ships. So what you would do is you would take a conventional internal combustion engine, maybe rip it out and put in a new engine, or maybe even refit that engine. I, I don't. I haven't actually done the numbers on on what's viable there. The opportunity is ammonia can be stored and transported much easier than hydrogen. Hydrogen's a real dog because the molecule's really small. It leaks out of everything and it makes everything brittle and it's flammable. Um, now, ammonia is also flammable, but, but you need a, a much higher spark temperature to get it going. The problem is that ammonia at room temperature and pressure is a gas and it's toxic to living things. But uh, we know how to store hydrogen, uh, uh, ammonia, uh, and you store it under a, um, like 300 bar pressure and it liquefies. So it's a little bit of pressure and it's okay. Challenges, it's toxic to people and plants and animals. It needs to be stored under pressure. The real problem is when we combust ammonia, the, the exhaust gas is full of nitrous, like a, a range of nitrogen chem, uh, compounds 
nitrous oxide being one of them. That's a problem. The next slide I'm going to show you claims to have actually got a catalytic converter system that actually resolves that. Have they done it? Uh, we'll see. Um, the real problem is with a system that's actually sort of out of tune, which happens all the time, we're going to get unburnt ammonia coming out the exhaust. So each of these systems will be a source of toxic gas to people. So as such, I don't think we're going to see ammonia in um, large population centres. Uh, the next slide is Toyota. So Toyota have actually um, claimed to have actually got a passenger car ammonia ICE system. Now, the way I'm showing this slide is it's, it's one thing to have a gigantic ship with an ammonia engine. But if you've got the same technology scaled down to a passenger car, the, the technology is mature. The reason I just previously discussed, I don't think we're going to see these in um, cities, large population cities, and we're now we're back to EVs, maybe hydrogen fuel cells. But but the technology is here. Uh, so so this this so what I would uh, I'm, I'll show you where I'm going to use these in a moment. So in terms of electricity generation for the purple transition, it's going to look like well the full system. In the face of volatility, we're going to have all the other systems like hydro, geothermal, wind, and salt. They all have their place, but there'll be no buffer for wind. The base load power generation and stability of system pressure, momentum, you know, the momentum behind the power grid, so we can actually push electricity a long way. These, we really do need those big power stations to do that. And so the conventional fleet of uranium based light water reactors. Uh, I think that will, will be very useful there. But what comes out of them is spent nuclear fuel, and that brings us to um, thorium molten salt. In a decentralized heat and electrical power production system where we're looking at a cocktail of thorium, some uranium, and some SNF, goes into a salt, and over time it will generate. Over time, I believe this will become the primary energy generation system once we mature the technology and society learns to trust it like we trust internal combustion engine and petroleum. Transport. So let's look at short range transport. This is all the stuff that happens in a city. So these are our vehicle classes. Passenger cars, commercial vans, motorcycles, combination electric vehicles and hydrogen fuel cells. But the batteries are sodium and fluoride battery chemistries. <clears throat> we will need an extra capacity from the power grid to charge the electric vehicles. We've got a plan for that. All the heavy stuff, your big trucks and your construction vehicles and your buses, hydrogen fuel cells, but our hydrogen production is going to be done through the burning of iron powder with seawater. And that requires electricity. So the idea is to put a thorium reactor be uh, behind a system that burns the, that, that produces the iron to be burnt. So these, there's no magic bullet, there's no magic technology that will help us, but if we have a network of technologies placed in a particular order where they overlap and support each other, we might have a system that actually might work. Long range, this is ammonia-fueled ICE, maritime shipping, aviation, and rail. So if we do have problems with ammonia gas, gassing off it, it the vehicle is going to be far away from people uh with a possible exception of rail um and so there's some judgment calls there now ammonia where do we make it well it's all based on hydrogen production and to date we've been talking about electrolysis which makes it a problem but if we can burn iron powder and seawater then that actually sort of comes online so yeah and so if we can do it in a small scale pilot scale decentralized context instead of like one central place that does everything the entire industrial grid becomes decentralized for both power heat generation hydrogen production and ammonia production so this is the purple transition three foundation technologies that facilitate everything else thorium msr electricity generation uh you got your conventional electronic demand you got charging of electric vehicles which is you know mainly passenger cars and commercial vans that are sold sodium and fluoride batteries combustion of iron powder or steel production that's actually consuming a lot of energy at the moment uh, especially in the post-fossil fuel systems and we want to support manufacture 
we're going to produce hydrogen with this heat. And that will fuel our hydrogen fuel cell network. You know, all our big trucks and buses and what have you. And it will be needed for steel production. Production of steel in a hydrogen atmosphere is actually the way they actually want to go forward when they phase out coal. Hydrogen will also be used for ammonia production, and that ammonia production will fuel ammonia ICE, and that ICE will do all the intercity transport and all the long-range transport. The thorium power will also be recycling the iron powder. So the thorium MSR supports the burning of iron powder. The iron powder supports the ammonia fuel ICE. Right, so it's a system that actually all connects together. Yeah, right. it's, that, got its, own, uh, it's, it's got some great elegance to it. It's not, it's, it's pretty, it's, it's, it's a pretty sort of simplistic concept at the moment. But so far, the bo bo bottlenecks and challenges each of those technologies face is far less than anything else I've got on the books at the moment. Now, are there, so this is all great in the theoretical space, but is there anything that we can do to kind of model out how civilization might adopt these technologies? I, I believe you mentioned the Hawaii report. Is that kind of what right. you were getting at? So I'm operating three, le three levels simultaneously. Um, I talked to the Club of Rome, and we're doing, and if it all works out, we'll be doing some work there. That's like the global system. Hmm. Then I work on a regional level, you know, like nation state. Uh, I've, I've just done a report for Australia, for example. Um, but let's take the state of Hawaii. It's an island chain in the middle of the Pacific. It's isolated, and it's a microcosm of the rest of the world. If Hawaii, as a full state, was to phase out fossil fuels, what would its options be? So instead of actually saying, you will do this or you will do that, there are lots of options we could use. And in Hawaii, there's lots of groups of people, and I call them tribes. Each group wants to see a particular solution. Like one group believes, for example, wave power is the way to go. Yeah, we're in the middle of the ocean, we've got big waves, we're doing wave power. <laughs> All right. So that's now a scenario. Or um, it will be, for example, um, uh, um, actually, instead of actually just talking about it, why don't I show you the actual scenarios? Yeah, the floor is yours. Hey guys, quick pause. I won't take too much of your time, but I just wanted to let you know that if you want to use and read the same newsletter that I do, Capitalist Exploits, we have a special $1,000 discount exclusively for Capital Cosm viewers of this channel. You simply have to click on the link down below, get your $1,000 discount. Super stoked about this. I discovered Chris and Brad newsletter, Capitalist Exploits, Four years ago, it set me on my investment journey. I attribute a ton of what I know to that newsletter. So if you haven't already, check them out. Click the link down below to learn more. Take advantage of this $1,000 discount. You're not going to find it anywhere else. All right, now let's get back to the video. So this is the Hawaii report in draft. You should be able to see that. Assessment of tasks to completely phase out fossil fuels. So that's with this group, uh, Sustainable Energy Hawaii. I write things like this into the draft to make sure people actually read it. I said, no, 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 we've got to edit that out. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, all right. So this is the, um, first of all, what we did was we mapped Hawaii. What's what's Hawaii doing now? And then um, if we, what are the systems that need to go and what is the physical work each of them have actually done? So if we did that, and then we actually started to look at, well, all right, what are our options? And if I can get down to, here we go. This is the scenario map. Okay. First scenario is, can you, you can see that, yeah? Yep. Yep. Scenario H0, that is no change. We do nothing and we proceed as, as planned. And what I've got there basically is peak oil. Uh, um, um, issues and all the other issues associated with continuing to use fossil fuels. Scenario HA, everything's electrified. So everything, uh, all vehicles are now electric vehicles and all power generation is... Uh, and so we, for, for scenarios um, A to D, I then actually worked out if all power was done exclusively by solar, wind, hydro, nuclear, 
biomass, geothermal or wave. That's to actually sort of show if we were to go that way, what are we looking at? Then we get to scenario HE, which is the first hybrid scenario, and that is the green transition as advertised. This is what we think we're going to do. And so using an energy split proposed by the IEA in 2050. HF is interesting, and this is actually unprecedented. If we were to apply the Club of Rome degrowth system, what would that actually look like? You know, you know okay, we're going to shrink the system by 70%. Okay. Um, well, would that help? The same population? Uh, I don't actually t use the word population. Okay. Because I hear a lot of stuff saying that we are going in the future being much more efficient, much more efficient. Um, we, we, we're just going to do things better, better. Yeah. And so the amount of electricity we will demand in the future will be like a fraction of what we do now because of technology. All right. Okay. Let's look at that. So I don't use the word population, but I do actually shrink everything. And so the size of the transport fleet, the amount of electricity demand, that, that'll shrink down to 31% of the full size of the green transition. Mm -hmm. Scenario HG, the circular economy, that basically says all things, are, all waste is captured and recycled. What's interesting there is we can act directly compare the size of the circular economy to the size of the green transition. And to date, in Europe, they still have not done that. And the outcome is the green transition is several orders of magnitude larger, much, much larger. And when we talk about the circular economy, we assume it's done in the background. Right. And so it's, there's this, this complete lack of situation awareness. So HH is the purple transition, which you've just sent. If we were to apply that and actually sort of apply the numbers in Hawaii, what would that look like? Uh, HI, which is now going to be put for HH, actually, is if we were to completely go small-scale regenerative organic farming and we were to do that in Hawaii. And so you, you, there are groups in Hawaii that are doing it already. And so, okay, great. We'll take a patch of land. That patch of land, how big is it? How many people do you support? What's your production over a period of time? If we were to replicate that across Hawaii in the land that is available, how many people could you support? And how many people would be involved in, in food production? And how many other people could you support so they could do other things? <laughs> and that's the, um, yeah, that, that's 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 what we sort of go through there. Um, right. So this is actually uh, supposed to compare everything else. And then there will be a section at the end where everything's compared against everyone else. And we can sort of say, from a point of view of numbers, if you were to do this, this is the amount of land you would need. And in fact, some of the things I've actually got. So you've actually got the land charted out for each one of these yeah. methodologies. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why we picked Hawaii. You map the place. How big is it? Right, so um, we've got th these sort of comparisons. If you were to do hydrogen economy, uh, and we're going to have solar panels, are going to make that hydrogen with ex uh, the exclusion of everything else. This is the land you need for those solar panels. Uh, that's the actual sort of land of you know, island of Oahu, and and so you, you end up with um, yeah. If we if we were to go, here's a good one. If we were to go scenario HC where everything is biomass and biomass and biofuel, which is what they believe. Well, plenty of biomass, you know, we don't need anyone else. All right. The amount of area, you know, we, we, we do things like this to make one litre of biofuel, how much water do you need and how much um, corn would you need and how much land would you need to do that? So, so that then when they extrapolate that across the numbers. So, this is the million tons of biomass, and the yellow is the amount of food that they actually consume annually in 2010. So, and now we're going to say, well, this is the actual land area of all islands in the state of Hawaii, and that's the amount of land, they arable land, to be producing biomass just for this. Right, and so it's what, what you're basically saying here is, is we can't do it for one reason or another. Um, 
So this is the green transition. So this is where we're now going to phase out fossil fuels. What does that look like? Okay. And so, all right. And so we go through all the calculations. What's interesting is every single one of these, when you actually sort of look at, well, how much energy do we need at the end and then carve it up by application, trucks, finding an alternative for your heavy trucks and your delivery trucks are taking 80% of the energy. Now, that's just an artifact of um, how effective diesel fuel is as an energy source. But if we were to replace it with something else and we were to do the same things, trucks are taking 80%. What that tells me, and this is where I'm going to start talking about Venus, is the architecture of our cities and our industrial grid now needs to be adjusted in line with our new energy systems. But actually, instead of spending 80% of our energy on trucks, can we do the same thing some other way? So, so that includes powering our homes. That includes flight travel. Yep. Every Everything rolled up into one. Trucks take up 80% of that energy? Yep. I've got wow. a crude calculation, so it's possible I've not got everything. The yeah. Yeah. So the yellow is charging the EV fleet, right? And the red is the uh, producing hydrogen for the truck fleet. And the gray is everything else. Yeah. Wow. So let yes, me zoom in. There you go. So Take a look these are that. the sorts of things. These these are the sorts of things that are coming out of these 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 reports. Uh, that they do tend to make people very angry. Um. But, you know, well, it's the numbers, guys. You know, don't shoot me. Is it? Uh, don't shoot me. I'm just the piano player. <laughs> um, so, this is an energy split put forward by the IEA in one of their reports in 2050. That's where wind and solar is going to take most of it. And so, if we did that, what would that look like? Um, and so, we've got, you know, You've got some assumptions about you know, the energy mix and how many power stations we're talking about. Right, so there's the existing power grid in Hawaii on the left, and that's the power grid on the right if we were to, to do this. That's that's what they've got to do. And so, um, yeah, we put things like this together. So that's the amount of power that we need from these sources, and this is how it's going to be used on the right-hand side. And so... Um, so, so when are you conducting this experiment and how long is it set to last? So this is, uh, we're doing, we're doing this for the, the calendar year of 2019. So it's a year in the past because so we've got the data so we can use and map. Mm -hmm. I'm using 2019 because it's the last year before COVID, the last year of sensible data. Uh, but it's, it's to make a point, if we were to translation our society, what would it look like? So it's one year. Um, and as for how long this is, well, I've got to I've got to write two more scenarios before it's done with everyone else. So this is the amount of land area we'd need. So the existing farms is brown, and the existing forests is your um, your crosshatch. Mm -hmm. If we were to use all the forests, this is the amount of land area that we would require for things like biofuel harvesting. Um, We'd need that, and we're exceeding the total area of Hawaii, so that's actually not possible. Um, so then we would go to um, yeah, we got, we got things like um, the big fuel store in Pearl Harbor that they use for the Navy. If they were to clean that up and repurpose it for pumped hydro storage, would it work? Um, and so ran some numbers on that, and the simple answer is not really. Um, here is the list of infrastructure needed for the green transition in just Hawaii. Just Hawaii. Uh, so remember, you've got 1.2 million people who've got to somehow come up with the tax base and the, and the money for procurement for all of this stuff to trans, trans, transform their society. And so... Um, 1.2 million people and a bunch of tourists. Yeah. And the tourists are, uh, are going to be reluctant to come if things like air travel is now very expensive. Mm-hmm. You've also got the problem of why are they going to be sending stuff to Hawaii if they can't pay for it? Yes, you know, the whole thing of, you know. So, all right, move away. Oh, yeah, this is an interesting one. 
what is the influence of putting in a single nuclear power plant? So scenario HE, we, we put in one average size nuclear power plant. All right, so what if we ripped that out and we went back to solar panels and wind turbines? And so you go through the numbers and you get this. Because the difference in availability, nuclear is so much more effective than solar. Solar is only a sort of running. In, in Hawaii has a solar radiance of 15%, where the rest of the world has 11 Right, so, so solar works better in Hawaii than most places in the world. But even so... You've got an, uh, the difference is this an extra 11,000 gigawatts of installed capacity. For, uh, uh, sorry, if you put in a nuclear power plant, you, you have less installed capacity of 11 point, you know, 12, 12 gigawatts, 485 fewer big wind turbines, or 12 million fewer. 450 solar panels and that's not instead of it's all of those together in a laundry list for the green transition according to the energy split so um so that's the influence of a single nuclear power plant all right degrowth we're now going to shrink the whole system to 30 you percent know, of its size <laughs> so luck. we go through the reasons the reason i picked that is hawaii is 15 percent self-sufficient for food so if you doubled food production and we became 31%, and the, the premise behind this is if the supply grid, the shipping supply was disrupted for six months, which that's the kind of world we're moving into. We could be looking at disruptions like that. Things still happen, but they just don't arrive when we think they will. Um, then Hawaii will have to sort its own stuff out because it's isolated. And food production's the metric. So if we go to, say, 31%, and if we shrink the entire system down to 31% of what it actually is. So and so we go through the number of vehicles and kilometres and, and, and all that sort of stuff. So this we, we end up with uh, 19 terawatt hours instead of 60. So it's substantially less. But to hit that, we are still talking about a, a large number of um, new power plants, like uh, 71 um, power stations for wind turbines of average size, which are like, like 60 wind turbines, 134 farms of solar, where each one's like installed like 30, 33 megawatts. Um, so you, you, you have to pay the piper. You, you can't just you, you can't just magical this away. You've got to do the work. So the amount of power is actually much less, okay? Um, but we still have like the number of vehicles, it's still the number of units. Um, let's get down to some graphs. Okay, so here is the land area required. So the top right-hand corner is the total land area for the state of Hawaii, it's all gray. Um, so the existing farms and forest, but now this, this hatched bit here, we're going to have new farm development. We're going to double the farm area. And we're going to have to cut into the forest area to do that a little bit. Um, and so, so now we're actually going to start harvesting biomass from the forest, which is, you know, is that environmentally responsible? Well, do you have a choice or should you do it? Uh, and then, then you've got the purple up here is land for other things like cities. And so the entire area of Hawaii. So if you were to go this way, um, what this is basically saying is 31% a 70% cut is not enough. And the problem is the footprint of the green transition systems is too large for too little in return. When I do this for the purple transition, for example, uh, this will have a much, much smaller footprint. And that's the problem. So... Um, so do you know what this? Uh, so this is the uh, the uh, um, infrastructure required. So again, we've got a lot of stuff. So we're going to shrink the system by seventy percent, but we still have to buy a lot of stuff. Um, so do you know what the circular economy is? You no. You understand what? No. Right. Go it. So this is this is a, a thing in Europe where instead of actually sort of getting our resources from mining, and instead of throwing our rubbish away, we're going to actually collect all waste, recycle it 
and the metals gained from that go straight into manufacturing and we don't need mining anymore. So um, let's see a nice graph for it. So here's the existing system that we do things at the moment in Australia, I suppose, you know, um, everywhere else. Natural resources, mine them, use stuff, throw it away, and put it in landfill. And all and the resources are going in one direction. But over time, wouldn't wouldn't the resources dwindle down? Because wouldn't it be akin yeah. to like giving yourself a blood transfusion from one arm to the other? So in the process, this is actually what's happening to us because the quality of resources is getting less and less, and it's requiring more energy to extract mm -hmm. them. So this is why this scenario is actually here. Um, so th there is useful stuff to do here, but, but, but it's, it's actually much harder. So, right. So this is the way of Hawaii is at the moment. The stuff coming in, most of it imports. So physical work done. We're consuming, they're consuming a lot. Then they're generating waste. Some things that produce as exports. This is what comes in. That's what goes out. And the stuff that goes into waste, some of it was diverted into a pyrolysis plant, but the rest goes into landfill. Right, so one and a half million tons goes into landfill every year. Go for 50 years, hmm, oh well. Um, right, so the circular economy is this idea where um, instead of throwing waste away, you recycle it and then you insert it's it all into the circle. Yeah, but it's not thermodynamically balanced. It's actually not possible in its current form. Uh, and that comes, a lot of that has come down to a thing that is not designed to be recycled. Um, so it's all good and well to think in these terms. But our technology, for example, like when you throw stuff in landfill, what's in it? <laughs> and you've got like the, the, this, this uh, very complex network of materials that you now have to recycle and actually extract apart. And so I've put all these systems together to show all this. So this, this, this is what they think the circular economy is. We manufacture it, we consume it, throw it away, recycle it, and then we go. The, and, and it's assuming that A, B, C, and D are the same in, in volume and quality. It's actually not true. This is what really happens. And so you get waste blooms and you growth on one side but not the other. And, you know, um, the design of stuff uses different technology and different materials, and it's, it's a dog's breakfast. So um, anyway, in Hawaii, for example, the industrial system can be split into seven distinct levels or, or sectors from exploration and mining all the way up to waste handling. Well, Hawaii interacts with the last three only. Everything is manufactured somewhere else and it's imported. Or, or almost everything. So the circular economy for why Hawaii will have to be everything is brought in by ship, it's consumed, everything is caught and collected and recycled and is put back on a ship and sent to wherever it is being made. And this has to be so effective, it's worthwhile. Wow. So Which, if you can get it done in Hawaii, you can get it done anywhere. Well, yeah. So the pro problem is is it's not thermodynamically balanced. Mm -hmm. And and so it, this is why it's not being done at the moment. So take you know, waste in Hawaii at the moment and we put this system together. And so if you catch everything, this amount of stuff is actually being... Um, uh, collected and supposedly recycled. And so if you were to do that, these are the numbers. And okay. And so, yeah, and that's as far as, that's as far as we've actually sort of got there. And so I've now got to write the last two. Yeah. Well, I mean, this has been like, you know, you know, when you have like an external hard drive, with like a couple terabytes of data, and then you just <laughs> upload it, like you, you, you connect it to your computer and you just copy paste all your files onto the computer and it takes like an entire day <laughs> for the file yeah. to copy over it. This is what it feels like. It was like a hard drive dump. I'm, I'm going to have to watch <laughs> this episode multiple times just to okay. make sure I, I digest the graphs properly and everything else. But this has been fascinating, Simon. Thank you so much for uh, for showcasing this. Okay. And the, the third one's at the third level, which we probably don't have time to go through, I suppose. But the third no, no, level... We can, go, we can go ahead. We can go ahead. Brilliant. Yeah. All right. Yeah, all right. Let's do it. Um, the third level is, um, all right, smart guy, you scared us now. Now you're going to fix it. Now you're actually going to do something. And so um, what I've got here, uh, this is actually now if we were to apply it and actually go and uh, make a city. Now what's mm -hmm. driving this is my understanding of what has to happen. What are, I've been modeling the system for years now and I've been talking to the people in charge 
and I've been seriously disappointed. And so what has to happen? So, so, so first, it's not a lack of ideas, right? It's, it's not a, that we don't know what to do. There are thousands of ideas out there. The problem is getting permission to look at those ideas because there, a lot of them are not acceptable. Right. The second thing that needs to happen is we've got to take those ideas and turn them into a um, useful um, engineering outcome. So hang on. Let me... Fair. Okay. So we need a, we need the equivalent of an innovation hub, uh, a place that can you take ideas and turn them into pilot scale. If you're going to talk to anyone with money, for example, and say we want you to make this kind of technology, they're going to say, "Show me how it's been done before before I'm going to give you any of my money." Right, and that's where things fall over. So we need. Um, so what I'm going to do. And what it also has shown me is what I'm proposing cannot happen inside the Western world. Anywhere in the Western world, anywhere in the developed world, if I stand up and say, I've got a strange idea or an innovative idea, thousands of people will literally stand up and stop me. Right, so I'm now going to go to somewhere outside the Western world and I'm going to develop an innovation hub. This innovation hub will be a research institute, and um, it's going to be a, like a, um, a, a series of office blocks. Because it's in the middle of nowhere, we're going to have accommodation for the people who are working there. And there's going to be a constellation of industrial scale, pilot scale units around there to trial ideas. And it'll be an innovation hub that will be co will be commercializing IP, but will also be selling the stuff we make. Okay, what I'm talking about here is an evolution. And, and so... I'm taking my ideas and I'm merging them together and I'm putting them in the Venus Project. So the Venus Project uh, was started in the 70s. Uh, Jacques Fresco, Roxanne Meadows. Okay. Um, they were... Um, I've taken their ideas and developed them and I've included all the ideas that I found in my travels and I've got this hybrid solution and I'm and I'm putting it in the, the Venus Project as a, as a step along. So I can just share my screen. Yeah, and it, a lot of us might recognize the Venus Project from the Zeitgeist documentaries that were so yeah. popular about ten years or so ago. Yeah. So, so this was actually um, this this was actually um, some. Hang on, let me get rid of that. Someone's actually messaging me. Go away. All right. So this is actually um, an evolution. Like if I was to put all my ideas together, and it says, "All right, put your neck on the block and give us a plan," what would that look like? And that's what this is. And so this is like uh, the existing system's failing. Uh, plan B is the green transition. That's not going to work. Uh, what's going to happen? Um, and so I'm, you know, this is like, you know, well, the purple transition, if we were to do that, where would we do it? How would we do it? How would we trial it? Uh, the system requires a new relationship between us, energy, raw materials, and the planetary environment. environment. So... That picture, by the way, I actually took that at Rainbow Beach, Australia. Oh, you know, it's not a stock purpose. image. Yeah, no, no, that's actually they're, they're my footprints. So it's, <laughs> uh, but but yeah, I'm, the reason it's there is I've come across quite a few people who believe one thing or another thing, and they and they they don't. They, it, it's like everyone wants to be in a tribe, yeah. and they want you to be in the same tribe. Or, or I'm burning a trail out to where there are no tribes. I'm very much on my own and I don't give a shit. Yeah. We were talking about this off air. Most people don't care for the truth. They don't care about results. They only care about self -ser self service to their ego, self service to their identity from which they take in, you know, these belief systems from. Yeah. So, but if, if we were to really have all problems on the table and all solutions at the same time, could we do stuff? The answer is, yeah. Uh, all right, so here's the vision. An evolution of the Venus Project powered by an unconventional energy source operating to a new resources management paradigm is now proposed. This plan will have elements of circular economy, steady state economy, permaculture, regenerative agriculture, degrowth, the Venus Project, and indigenous knowledge from around the world. We're taking ideas from all of that. And because we're building from scratch, 
you know, you, we're, we're turning up to an area where there's nothing there. So what we build is if we keep all that stuff in mind, we're actually not uh, um, we're not repeating ourselves. It's actually easier to do once you've actually sort of built the site and everything. It's what do you build? How do you design? So I'm talking about building a couple of office blocks, accommodation around that, and industrial sites around that. So we're talking about a relatively small site that will later expand. And, and people it, to, I, I yeah. think it's interesting. Sorry, didn't mean to cut you off, but yeah. uh, the indigenous knowledge from around the world, most people would associate indigenous knowledge with very low tech yep. uh, type of things. So what, there's, there's two frontiers that we need to actually make, make friends with. One is our industrial systems have got to coexist peacefully with the planetary environment. At the moment, they certainly do not. Uh, I'm talking about species die off, ocean acidification, land degradation, mm. plastics in the sea. Uh, th these these problems are very really large, right? Um, and we've been running for about 200 years like this, um, and and so so these are, are structural problems to sit behind it. So there's industry. The other one is our how we grow our food. Our industrial ag agriculture at the moment has got to evolve so it can actually work with those natural systems, not against them. And the reason I include Indigenous knowledge, yes, they're low tech, but the Aborigines in Australia, for example, were stable for a thousand years, or th thousands of years, sorry, mm. you know, uh, uh, to the point where they didn't bother evolving out of the Stone Age. Why? How? And so when we do so, what can we learn from that as we are looking at a new system? Okay, so all of that's now being merged into... Um, up against uh, things that I found in my work and my friend and colleague Harold Sverdrup of Norway has come to similar conclusions. Oh, the Scandinavian alliance. Uh, actually, my cunning plan was for the Nordic frontier to merge. We, I, I, I could see Europe breaking up but or Europe becoming less relevant, but the future could be an industrial alliance between uh, an alliance between industrial clusters between Finland, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, and Iceland, which has Greenland in there as well. Yeah. And so the Nordic frontier would become a power block. So, uh, well, yeah, I mean, anyway. you've, you've got access to oil and gas exploration as well. Yep, that's right. right it's a, it's a, if, if we cut the crap and actually made a proper plan, that might work. How, how likely do you think that is? Zero. <laughs> if we cut the crap. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, yeah we, we, they're not interested. The, the no, people in the Nordic frontier, all the um, decision makers, are convinced they've got everything in hand and they know what to do, and that they're ahead of the rest of the world. Right. So they, they look at my work. They don't. They don't dismiss it, but they said, "Yeah, you know what? But um, we've got our own answers." Um, but w once, once reality, you know, they're between that rock and a hard place, right? And they and and they face reality. The cultures here are strong enough to step up to the challenge. And so the, the, there's an industrial plan that I was, I was going to put forth, but it's, it's not relevant to them now. Anyway, meanwhile, back at the ranch. No, meanwhile, back at the bat cave. Um, <laughs> yes, we will construct a technology innovation hub in an unconventional city to the purpose of developing a new energy, raw materials and manufacture paradigm, operating a new kind of society. Areas of investigation will range from a completely new energy par paradigm to biomimicry and everything in between. We seek to develop a more sustainable relationship with the planetary environment. And we will develop an agricultural methodology that merges food production with natural biosystems without using petrochemicals. The principles of permaculture and regenerative agriculture will be used to symbiotically merge food production with all natural biosystems. Food production would then work with natural biosystems, not against them. And we seek to develop a comprehensive plan for so social reclamation, which human beings, technology, and nature will be able to coexist in a long-term sustainable state of dynamic equilibrium. Uh, we wish to leave uh, our grandchildren a world worth living in. So this, this sounds like a, a massive task, but it turns out there's an enormous amount of work that's already been done. We've just got to give it a go. So it's kind of like yeah, turnkey? Huh? It's kind of turnkey? Yeah. So, 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 so it's just like like start small, 
do a small task first, and when that's done, do another task and another task, and Bob's your uncle. Now, if, if, if I say it, it's all going to start up with a couple of office blocks, accommodation around that in an area with uh, a small-scale, pilot-scale industrial units, uh, uh, plants around it, and we'll have it be self-sufficient in power, water, uh, in, and, and power generation and water generation in the short term, and in the long in the longer term we'll start producing biomass stuff as yeah. well how do you how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time yes exactly and make sure the elephant doesn't run away yeah get us um, the elephant yeah so th there's a lot of uh stuff out there in in the world that that that, that wants to see humanity punished they, they they will not talk solutions we don't care right so so um you will be punished. We've done the wrong thing. Um, any, it's, it's like they love the doom. Mm. Now, there are challenges in front of us, and the majority of people point blank refuse to acknowledge the problems, let alone see the solutions, which means they get the doom. But it doesn't happen to happen for everyone. And so instead of trying to actually just save 8 billion people, you know, like have a system that's actually saves humanity, what I will do is find some like-minded people Go and do something at small scale, show that it works, and yeah, come back in 10 years and we will do business. So at the moment, I work for GDK, a geological survey of Finland, on a, um, and this is all on a volunteer basis. If funding can be raised to the point where I can actually leave my, um, leave my post and take up a, a new position, a, a separate business entity will be formed. We will manage a series of feasibility scopes uh, feasibility studies and then we'll actually start um, putting industrial assets on the ground so we must change the rules of what can and cannot be love this picture so it's um yeah so the guy underwater yes looking in his own wheelchair yeah you've just changed the medium uh, that's right yeah so i often use my wife's my wife's an artist and I often use the art that she makes. So, um, so when the orthodox methodologies prove to be inadequate, turn to the unorthodox or accept failure. Use the past unorthodox ideas differently in conjunction with present cutting edge technology to create a new paradigm where the future limitations are seen in a new light. So, so this is this is um, crazy town stuff for you know European politicians. Right, this oh no 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 we, we 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 can't tolerate this so okay it's nice so so I, I i don't engage with them with this stuff the industrial evolutions at the crossroads between ruin and the stars what have we really learned germany the entire nation state of germany is on that last point now so the whole system is about to evolve to a new equilibrium and you've we've got to do stuff ourselves we we, we need a plan and instead of actually trying to put some solutions on the ground in an existing city or an existing systems, it's a whole lot easier to go out to somewhere completely new and start again because the design of everything is so different. So we're going to operate on these three fronts uh, together. There's um, My work sits in the top right-hand corner in the industrial system, raw materials and energy. So... There's the interaction term with the planetary environment and there's this, this new social contract. To me, the industrial stuff's easy and I need a counterpart in the other two. When you talk to people in the climate change activist movement, for example, they see all three as in interchangeable. It's not the same thing. Um, you know, like... like a, um, a new planetary uh, relationship with the planetary environment is not the same thing as a new kind of industrial system right you need both uh now technology also has a way of ordering society like, like when when um the electric motor was invented and it was wide use society organized itself around that technology so if we're going to make disruptive technology that changes the architecture of that society it'll be a different kind of society that actually uses that so we're going to start out as a private company with a job to do, but eventually we'll morph into a society, 
or a community. What that will look like remains to be seen. All three sectors will start at the same time, but we will see results in the industrial sector first because it's it's much easier to do. The interaction with the planetary environment will take years to, you know, fix the soil, balance the soil, look at the watershed, get biosystems growing, get crops growing. Uh, it, 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 it'll, it, the planetary environment will come in behind that uh, system. And the new social contract, everyone who's tried that before has failed. Uh, like all the hippie communes that they had in the United States, they all failed. You know, why? We need to look at that. Um, and so there'll be like a, I suppose you'd call it a philosophy school where, and we'll get someone like Daniel Schmattenberger to actually sort of lead that sector and to actually sort of have a discussion about what kind of society you want to live in. I've got some ideas with actually a, a combination of all other systems we've seen so far, and we're going to develop something unprecedented, right, based on the restraints that we've got. So how do you so, how do you go about converting the masses who are just conditioned to instant gratification and the current culture that we're living in now? How do you get well? How, how do you change this, this societal contract? Oh, I think it's going to have to be in stages where you, you're going to have to, in a small scale, we'll we'll do like a a, a simulation like in a small scale in a. I, I, I was going to have like a game theory lab that was going to simulate a series of systems over a 500 year time frame to see what works and what doesn't um, and then develop a plan we change the nature of money we we have uh, um, a symbiotic marriage of the awakened individual also with the idea of a community where we work together in groups um, but it's in a decentralized network we're not going to have like a city like say Los Angeles, that's administered from one point. And so the, it, it works on a small scale uh, and we've got to actually try things out and have that society try it and come to the conclusion that the system can be trusted. And so you do it in steps and stages over time, or we could have the working environment in the background go, go haywire and all our conventional systems break down and, and we are forced into doing something new. It might be a big old mess. I understand exactly what to do in the top right-hand corner. I have a vague idea of what to do with the bottom uh, uh, system, but you know, I'd like someone like Bandana Shiva to actually lead that. And then, we're, and, and and then the social contract uh, ideas. Is that even possible? We will start. We will find out. If we can get all three wings in together, we then move into the center, and we have a genuinely sustainable human civilization post fossil fuels. And there's a lot of work there. The industry, the industrial technology stuff to me is relatively easy compared to the other two tasks, but we have to undertake them. There's lots of other groups around us that are looking at this. Like the, the, the Venus project's full of people uh, in the Venus community that's looking at the top left-hand point. There's a lot of discussion. What they need is money and resources to actually give it a go. Uh, and, and and is it stable? Like, will it last longer than five years? You know, we're back to what were the pressures that destroyed all previous examples? But then you've got groups like the Amish that have been stable for 400 years. You know, <laughs> what, you know uh, or, or, or the other one is the Findhorn um, Society in Scotland. Yeah, because anyway. The, the, these but, are sim yeah, because they're not complex societies. And so there's not just like one point, single points of failures on their, yeah. on their grid, so to speak, which, you know, they're kind, right, of, so, they're so, kind of anti-fragile to take a term from yeah. Nassim Taleb. And a friend, so, so all of these ideas are going to be put into uh, a project and that project will be wrapped around the ideas that were developed in the Venus project. And the Venus project will have like the Venus projects based in Florida, but it's got lots of other projects like it's doing, will be one of their sub projects. We will take on, if it all works out, you know, uh, an ideas, a set of ideas, and it'll be an evolution of what they're doing now. So, um, and that brings us to the Prometheus Institute. This is the at the heart of all of an, in, uh, an innovation hub. My most of my professional career has been involved in um, uh, research and academia. 
you know, what have I learned? And there's some more of my wife's artwork. Love using it. Hey, develop an innovation hub. Assemble all unorthodox I can, ideas I can lay my hands off all in one place. Complete access to orthodox methodologies like how things are done now. The people there will be given a mandate and permission to look at unusual ideas in a way where they can cross-fertilise and nurture. That does not happen in existing research institutions. It's the nature of funding that has done that. We are not open-minded at all. These guys will be up, uh, guys and girls will be able to operate to a mandate to reinvent the industrial system, develop a suitable system of high-density energy generation. Like, uh, the thorium systems, they look great, and the iron systems, they look great. Can we look at it? Now, now we're getting sneaky. Now, this is the part here that, that, that is new. Develop a new system to source raw material commodities that are local. All the stuff about the circular economy. So in, instead of actually sort of developing everything to the metrics of performance, we're now going to look at it in terms of, well, where do we get our raw materials from? What do we do with them? And if we had to take care of matters of ourselves because everyone else around us is unreliable, how do we do that? Develop a manufacture chain to produce finished products from, the more, 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 from raw materials for some components in one city. So what I'm sort of planning there, for example, is if if you had a look at the implications of, so say, 3D printing and your new CNC you know, machining uh, technology, but if you source the raw materials for that from the local environment and you actually made the 3D printer feedstock from the rocks around you, you didn't have to import it anymore. What are the implications of that? So we have the potential to collapse the six continent just in time supply grid into one city for some things, not everything. So I've got this idea of um, uh, energy. Uh, the research I've done for the last six years has shown that that we don't really understand what energy is. Like we use it, uh, but the, there's, there are all sorts of inefficiencies in there that, that we don't quite understand. There is an interface between energy and life systems that, that we don't quite understand. Uh, there's the thing of like, like you're growing a set of plants under a router Wi-Fi with the Wi-Fi turned on versus when the Wi-Fi is turned off. Plants grow much faster. Th th there is a um, th there is a uh, interface there. So understand what exactly we are we are dealing with. The game theory laboratory, develop a game theory lab. This is to look at different systems. Uh, I, I used to play uh, RPG games uh, when, when I was younger, and I liked the idea of a group of people sitting around running a simulation where computers are not involved. So a game theory lab will normally have computers, but in parallel with that, I'm going to run people. So establish a gaming RPG library that would make a geek blush. So like D&D um, &D for commodity, for the commodity yep. sector. Well, in, in all seriousness, um, in all seriousness, one of the ways that we were going to um, educate industrial professionals was to develop a game for the circular economy. Right, and actually show how it works. And we've got the first generation sort of up and running, and it doesn't quite work. And we, we've got like the idea of, you know, where you get your commodities from. But then I would actually take a game like Ticket to Ride, We've got a network of trains and you can have a series of factories and mines that you've got to transport goods between to make it work. Yeah, anyway, so so develop a series of systems over 500 years. What social contract system will survive? And what might disruptive technologies be? And is there things like what's the implications of AI? You know, run that through game theory. Or if we had like a civilian space industry where you had thousands of civilians up in orbit doing stuff, how, how might that change things? So this is another one of the mind maps where we're actually going to look at different things and different scales, historical circumstances, uh, like try and understand what's happened in the past um, and why was that relevant. How far and, along are you with these simulations? Oh, well, how long's a piece of string? Every time I sit down with, with um, 
with my mates over a beer, uh, some of this stuff gets worked on. Um, in practical terms, not very far, because it has to be written down in a form that is useful. At the moment, it's just like a mass of PowerPoints that are not necessarily... Uh, they're written in Simon. Yeah. So, um, so um, there's Copenhagen Topics. Yeah, so, so this is back to this idea where... Come back here. Right. The reason I like the Venus idea of redesigning a city is the fundamental outcome is that trucks are taking 80% of our energy on the other side of fossil fuels. So we need... The, uh, Alice Friedman wrote a very good book called When Trucks Stop. Right. So, so um, our current society is dependent on trucks. We can't just cut back on them and hope for the best. So we've got to look at that society. Right, so here is when I was in Amsterdam. They, they had this amazing system mm. of bicycles Bicycles, pedestrians, and cars had their own dedicated traffic lights, and it was all in a system optimised together. Whereas in Australia, bicycles are sort of wedged in the corner and we just, just you know, try not to run them over. Um, but in Amsterdam, it's actually more preferable to ride a bike around because it's easier and cheaper. And they've done things like uh, they've got like an underground bicycle park that, under the main train station that houses 7,000 bicycles. Wow. But in a way... Where you can get in and find your bike easy, and it's free. Yeah. Well, if you think Australia is bad, I mean, you're probably one percent of the roads actually have bicycle lanes here in, in the United States. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's that's the way we've we've been built though. Anyway, so the idea was to actually have um, rail between cities and collapse the industrial system onto that rail network, but within the city, have transport done differently. Now, here's some of Jacques Fresco's drawings. They're pretty cool. Uh, I, if, you, if you actually go out to Florida and do one of their tours, you actually get to see Jacques' lab where he actually makes all this stuff and draws all this stuff, and it's, it's pretty cool. So um, when you actually look at truck transport, you know, where do trucks go, what you find is it's nonlinear. A disproportionate number of kilometres, ton kilometres, happen on a small number of routes. Like, say, shipping containers will come on a ship, they'll come to a port, but then they'll actually disperse to other areas through predetermined routes. And you find that in cities as well. Trucks aren't going everywhere all at once. They'll go to some sectors and use the same major roads most of the time. Not all the time, most of the time. Right. So, and so the idea is this. Instead of actually sort of replacing all trucks, we're going to replace some trucks. We've got the idea of the monorail. Now, this is you know, Jacques' uh, drawing. When he drew this stuff in the in the late 70s, monorails were genuinely innovative. Now, well, they're everywhere. Um, not widely used yet. But you couple this idea with, uh, I, I saw this um, in a group that's proposing this for a mine site to actually transport ore. Um, when you want to transport something heavy and lots of it over a distance and they're rough, rough terrain, instead of actually sort of making a road, which is really expensive, you can actually sort of have these um, uh, up on uh, metal stilts and you've actually got the pod that actually sort of goes up and back. Um, these guys sent me their... Um, their, their uh, uh, what am I saying? Their, their, their proposal. So the idea is... On the top, we have a two-way monorail. Underneath, we have shipping containers in this sort of form here where they can be dropped down and picked up, but in a thing that actually can shoot up and down. So you can have shipping containers go between two fixed points. Like say, to say you, let's say you've got a city, two sectors in a city, one where, uh, where, where things go back and forth. And so we still have some trucks and buses, but just less of them. So the and so that would then change how that city would then look. So, um, oh yeah, for the biosystems, uh, like the new, a new kind of agriculture, the idea is to actually get all parties around the table for a brutal, frank discussion after everyone's had half a bottle of scotch. 
like, like, like because I used to work on an organic farm, and so there's that, that group. But conventional horticultural science has got an enormous amount to contribute if they're allowed to. The groups don't like each other at the moment. Lock them in a room, get them drunk, and then then have some sort of discussion, and then try those ideas out. So um, over time, you settle in and way forward. So um, so the idea is to actually build a city, and I've picked like ten thousand people as like a long term goal. So we're talking about a round city that's about you know like like two three kilometers in diameter. So we're not talking about a lot. It's like a suburb in a city. It's not a large settlement. And so, um, yeah, the Prometheus Institute is an R&D hub of 2,000 scientists, engineers, and technicians. And then you've got all the support stuff around that. And then you've got a constellation of industrial sites around the city. And so I've gone through some metrics. Here's my wife's rendition of what what that city would look like mm. from the air. This is just like a, an artist's impression of what it could look like. Yep, um, centric. So you've got your agriculture and the out on the outside, yeah. and your living quarters, so, I guess, on the inside. And then in a train, um, tra in a train uh, circuit, like a monorail circuit with shipping containers, like we showed, in a ring, you've got a constellation of industrial sites around the city, and and things are being moving between them, people and goods, and we don't need trucks to do it. There's still be roads. Is there a model for this, obviously, on a lower tech scale of this yeah, concentric yeah, yeah. model? Like, have civilizations in the past ever used something like this before? So, as it turns out, every civilization you look at in the past has used a round architecture. Mm. So, there's, there's lots of them. There's a group in Costa Rica that's looking at just regenerative agriculture only, and they've picked a round concentric circle architecture. So, it, it seems to be the go-to um the uh, um the go-to way to, to, in, to do in, things and in the same way that you have your living quarters in the center and your agriculture on the outer yeah. ones okay yeah and so it's 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 a it's a conceptual idea at the moment but now we've gone very very far away from the original discussion of the circular economy we're now actually designing an entirely new conceptual city so this is what i want to do for my next professional era step Right, and so this is what's sort of been developed. My current work at GTK will run its course, and if money can be uh, available, I will stand down and develop that full time. Um, yeah, and so you know, my Matt, uh, uh, yeah, we, we, we've got to sort of develop it over time, but there is a plan on the ground. Yeah. Well, <laughs> hey, talk about energy density, more like information density. This video has been packed with data, information. I can't thank you enough for coming on, Simon. Unfortunately, I've got to run in a bit. Yeah, but yeah. No, uh, where can people find you? Okay, so I've got a website, Um that, that uh, I try to put all my work on there. It hasn't been updated in a while, but anything I do goes onto that website. Um, I haven't had the bandwidth to actually maintain it the way I should, but all going well that's where all my work can actually be found fantastic go ahead and follow simon now, do you use twitter at all i used to but but the people on it were were uh, amazingly rude and I, I, didn't yeah, okay. I didn't i didn't i didn't see the point <laughs> well um, all right well hey guys if you enjoyed this video be sure to give it a like comment down below share uh, let me know what you think. Let me know what you think of the Z Venus Project. What do you think of uh, Simon's ideas here? Do you agree or disagree with any of his assessments? Let me know down in the comments below. Look forward to seeing your reactions there. And with that said, you guys, I will see you in the next episode. Bye, y'all. Hey, guys.